Thanks. And David, thank you for that introduction and, uh, and all the other details. And yes, I am a nature photographer, outdoor photographer, but I have seen the light, no pun intended. Um, I, I've really also been just a general photographer because everything interests me. And, and I realized that was difficult in my business, trying to advertise, promote myself as an blank type of photographer. The ad agencies, the editorial magazines wanted to know, well, do you do nature or people? Well, I always sort of balked at answering that because I really do a little bit of everything. And I just love life and I love photography. So it was difficult from a marketing point of view to, because people wanted to pigeonhole me. But eventually I persevered and I still do a little bit of everything. My, my love is being outdoors. And so travel and nature really work well hand in hand for that because you're outside a lot when you're traveling and just seeing so many different things. What I'm going to talk about today is from static to dynamic and just uh, ideas to take your pictures to the next level. It's not a technical uh, presentation. It's about the seeing process, about light and composition and so forth, and about creative vision. And I would like to hold, I think David might have said this, but I'm forgetting already, to hold questions to the end so that I can keep sort of on a pace to get through this. And if I need to, I'll speed it up a little bit. But one of the biggest questions that I get in workshops a lot is, can you really uh, learn cr to be creative? Can you become a creative person? If, or is it just this natural gift that one has? And my answer is that you can develop creative vision. You can develop your own unique creativity. But you really have to open yourself up to things. You have to develop that creativity by opening your eyes to see the world around you more deeply. And it, you, you want, you really want your eyes open at all times. So when you're going to the dry cleaners, when you're going to the restaurant, when you're walking down the street to drop something in FedEx, you should be always looking. Be present in the moment. And, and even if you can't have your camera with you, you practice daily seeing. You just mentally click, oh, that would make a great picture, you know? If you can have your camera at all times, that's great. Jay Mizell once said that he never has to plan to go out to shoot. If he always has his camera with him, then he's always ready. And, and that's not possible for all of us, you know, depending on our work and what we've got going on. And if you're dragging a bunch of laundry to the, you know, dry cleaners, then maybe you don't have room for your camera, but you can still see. And you can still make mental note, oh, I've got to come back at 1030 and get that shot because I really like what the light's doing and what's happening. So that practicing daily seeing will develop your creative vision. You open up and you, you find yourself passionate about everything around you. Now, if you're a nature photographer, Great. It may be nature things that interest you most. What you're going to see here today is a mix of things. If you're a travel and or a street photographer, there's lots of things around you all the time to photograph. Regardless of the subject, just practice composing, practice looking at the light, practice that daily seeing. And then finally, but not finally really, is believing you're creative. And, and I say finally because you can have all of these other things working for you, but if you don't have a core belief that you are creative, that you are inherently a creative being, then you're going to struggle with making your best pictures and feeling like your pictures are good enough. And we all have it. I will be the first one to say the self-doubt talk really gets in there. When I start looking at so-and-so just came back from Antarctica and I'm drooling over his pictures and I'm thinking, oh, you know, I, I really wish that I could make a picture that good. And then I realized, well, wait a minute, I make other pictures that are that good. It's just that I was lusting after that one shot. And the self-doubt starts to get in there and you start thinking, well, maybe, maybe I just, you know, I need to work at this better or maybe I need to see differently or blah, 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 whatever it is. You just got to cut that out and just don't let that critic, the parent in you or the, the, the self-doubting judge get in the way and just go out and just say, OK, I hear you, but I'm just going to shut you off and I'm going to play and I'm just going to experiment and I'm going to stretch myself and I'm not going to worry about the results specifically in that moment. I just want to be uh, expressing myself and expressing what I see around me more creatively. If you believe you are creative and if you are open with your vision, 
you will be able to take a straight shot of a rose and have it develop into something much more expressive. When I first looked at the rose, that literal picture took my breath away because the color palette was so yummy. But I knew that there was a picture beyond that. And so by just opening up to what really was there in front of me and looking beyond it being a literal rose, I was able to see into the petals and find that one dewdrop that was just sitting on the edge. If you are learning to see more deeply and you're opening yourself up to what's around you, you'll be able to take a picture like this, which is kind of fun but a little chaotic, and you'll pick out something in the picture like maybe that, oh good, we can still see it barely on the flat screens, it's hard. And you'll turn another, you'll turn another picture. And this is the picture that excited me out of all of that. And somebody said, well, how did you even spot it? Well, because I turn on the binocular vision in my head, you know, and, and it may not be through the lens, but often I'll use my long lens and I'll scan the whole scene to find something that I like. But after a while, you just look at the scene and you say, oh, look at that. I love how that laundry is all surrounded by those rooftops. And if I then put on my long lens, this is what I'll get. And so you just have to be able to sift through the chaos. And that's what our world is. It's, it's a visual stimulus that's overloading our brains because there's just so much to look at. You have to learn to simplify and you have to learn to binocular zoom and just really sort of isolate with the camera up at your eye or without. But if you can develop that and you can really uh, push yourself beyond the straight shot and say what else is in here, you'll find things like this. Van Gogh, the painter, said, paint what you see at first go. And I thought about how that relates to photography. And I think that it's, it's a valid statement. It's about responding to what's right in front of you in the moment. Now, how many of you have heard of an approach to photography called Mixang? M-I-K-S-A-N-G, just one or two hands, maybe three. Okay, um, I'm not here to talk in depth about it, but there is a style of photography called Mixang, which in Mixang, when loosely translated, means good eye. And not just good eye for composition, but a good, pure, um, sort of unadulterated eye, like a child, open and accepting and excited about what you're seeing with that eye. And in that same process, using the Mixang approach, it's about reflexive, reactive photography. So it's walking down the street and going, oh, wow, click, without overanalyzing, without figuring out, do I need F16 or F8? Do, you know, some of that becomes intuitive, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But it's, it's really just responding to what's out there. So this next series of pictures is really about that. It's walking down the streets in Charleston and looking down and saying, ah, oh, look at that, and just loving the clover that was growing up through the, the grate. And because I've been doing this for a long time, basically framing pictures becomes easier. I kind of know intuitively what I want out of the shot, but my first reaction is what I'm going with, and I'm not trying to overwork it. And I'm doing these handheld. So you know, I'm walking down the streets in Santa Rosa, and I see the shadow of the chain on the parking post, and then I see this yellow, and I like the shadow on that. And so it's just that juxtaposition that caught my eye. You're not going to react favorably, all of you, to every picture I'm showing. This is a, a real mix here. But it's just getting you thinking about that reactive process and just not overanalyzing. So you know that this is obviously a painter just by having photographed that part of him. And that's what drew me was the paper towel. And obviously, he's not using it because he's been using the side of his jeans, you know? <laughs> and so there's a humor in there. And that's what I was responding to was the classic, you know, man thing where they just wipe their hands on their pants, you know? So, and this was a response to red, but also the juxtaposition of this teeny car against the big building in Florence. And I just thought it really looked small against that. So all of these are just that. They're just sort of an initial response to something that I've walked by. Now I'm in Marjorelle Gardens in Marrakesh, and it's a beautiful place to photograph, and there's stunning things to work there with your tripod and careful compositions. But this happened to be one of those things I walked by, and the bougainvillea had just dropped onto the bench some blossoms. And I went, ah, oh, I just really love the graphics. I love the moment of it.
I was sitting in a restaurant in, um, on Madeline Island in Wisconsin in the uh, Lake Superior, and I happened to look over the girl that was across from me. I looked over her shoulder and saw the screen and the window box from the outside all backlit. And that was just a quick response to that. So the pictures are just everywhere. And in this mix shows such a crazy assortment but if I'm paying attention to everything around me and I'm looking, even as I'm talking to people, I will see something. And I say, excuse me for a minute, and I might make the picture right then and there. It could be that you're just on a walk with your dog, you know, and the azaleas were in peak bloom, but now they're on the ground. Well, it, the pictures don't stop just because the azalea blossoms fell to the ground. You find things like this that are equally beautiful. And lately, you've probably had more of this to look at on the ground <laughs> in this, you know, neck of the, the country. But um, I hope spring comes soon. It is. It, it's here. So these are responding sometimes just to the color, you know, that contrast of the plant against that blue wall. This one was responding to the delicate white of these azaleas against that rough wall, and yet it echoed the white wash that was on the wall. And I liked how it sort of framed the flowers in there. So I can talk about them after the fact like this, but mostly I'm shooting from a gut reaction to what I'm seeing. It's just, oh, look at that. You know, that's interesting. It might be a rain puddle or a parking lot that happened to fill up a little bit, and you've got some great opportunities for reflections. This series here, I've got three, I think, came from Myanmar, all from restaurants. I'm sitting in the restaurant, and I look up, and I see this great graphic of the, the little shade that they put down and the roof line, and I just went with it. On my way to the bathroom in another place in Myanmar, I was about to turn left and go past the sink, and I went, oh my gosh, look at this. I've got the temple, the little pagoda reflecting in the mirror, and it was just sort of a funny scene for an outdoor sink in a bathroom to have that wonderful view through the mirror. This was another restaurant. This was uh, Morocco, actually. And my guide looked at me really puzzled because we went through the restaurant. We went to the back veranda to sit down. And I got out there and I went, oh my gosh, look at this. And so I'm down on the ground. Everybody else is kind of moving to the tables. And I'm down on the ground trying to get this framed up the way I wanted. So I was taking a little bit more work on this one. And he's thinking, what in the world is this girl doing? But when I showed him, he got it. And later he said to me, he says, I see the world differently through your eyes. It's so fun to have you here. So he really likes working with me on my trips there. So just again, responding to things we see. I'm in Cuba. I love the cars. But then my guide walked. He was starting to move on. And I said, don't move. I just had him freeze right where he was because he just filled that space so nicely. And I could have waited hours, days for somebody to do that for me if it hadn't been him, you know, just waiting for a person to come along. So you want to pay attention to the fringes of activities, too, OK? And in photographing, like, you know, there might be a group photographing something. But pay attention to what's going on behind you and around you. And I was doing that in Guatemala. We were photographing a young girl, and she had some chickens on her lap and all this stuff. And I happened to turn, and she was watching the whole thing through the privacy of the curtain. And I just loved having that curtain over her face, that separation and the shyness that came out, you know? So you just never know where your pictures are going to come from. Some of you that have gone to Maine workshops have probably seen this parked on the side of an uh, intersection with 90. And it's been a fun place to photograph, fun vehicle. And this is just wild. It's, it's hard to know in from out. And that's why I photographed it, because it's a door. And you step into that little archway to go through the door. But with the play of angles and the light and everything on it, it's very abstracted. And it's just a lot of fun. So creativity is about seeing deeply. Okay, It's about using your emotions, your intellect, and your senses. Everything has to be alive and working with you to be creative, to really be in that creative space where you're going to see and pull off what you see as a translation in the camera. Um, so those are the key things that I wanted to just leave that section with right here. Now, all of that's fun. There's a lot of playful stuff going on with what I was just showing you. But you, know, you need to clarify your vision. 
you can go out and you can practice. And as a way to get past the, the creative block that we often get, I, I encourage you to just wander with your camera and shut off all the sensors and just go and just play and it'll loosen you up. But when it comes down to serious photography, you want to clarify your vision, okay? What is it that you're trying to say with the photograph you're about to make? And Ansel said it best. You know, we've got technical, you know, we've got our digital cameras, get the exposures right if we know what we're doing. We can get our focus right, our depth of field right. We've got the timing on the shutter perfect, everything. But if you still really weren't clear on what you were trying to isolate and what you were trying to frame, then the picture comes out as a fuzzy concept. And so you want to really ask yourself, on the simplest level, what is the picture about? So for me, it was about those wonderful little drops of rain, actually. It was a mist that was building up and hanging on. And they weren't getting knocked off. And so that's what this picture was about. This was all about the incredible reflection in the water and the pattern that the water was making as it ran over a real shallow area in <laughs> Zion. This was about the humor of you know with the things we have to do and you know it was an old house it was an old hotel actually historic one in death valley and you pay 460 some dollars to stay there a night but they can't change the windows because it's they have to leave them historic so in order to keep the window up they have to prop with hangers and so you know but it's kind of like our houses you know an old house you know you do things to make it work and i just love that that scene and the softness of the colors in cuba Che Guevara is everywhere, right? He's the, he's the hero. And he is everywhere. And they will stencil him into your cappuccino if you want. And it's just, I, of course, I had to do that. It was just too funny. So it's just a simple picture of that. But it's, you know, it's just about, you know, the fact that, that he's there. And I was clear on, I've got, I'm doing a body of work that has this influence of Che, you know, the presence of Che being everywhere in Cuba. This was just about the humor of it, the face that I saw on the boat when I was walking by. I went back later and I did more serious stuff with the reflections and the, but, but it was just one of those things that makes you laugh. I liked this picture for the juxtaposition of the colors, the soft palette, and it's, it's a pastel palette, so that feels soft, feminine, delicate, and then it's industrial. You've got this pipe you know, tucked away in there, and it's just a, a, you know, some wall in a city. This was down in Cuba, the fragility of this staircase, and it's still in use, but you know, it doesn't look like it would be too safe, propped up with wood so it doesn't rub the cement, and you know, a lot of things. And it was that urban texture and detail that I really liked. If you're really paying attention and you're looking, you'll see things like this. It's, okay, this woman's walking around and she's playing, and you could do like the big scene of her, or you could do just her hand. There's lots of photos in there. But how ironic was it that she was wearing a dress that had these wonderful keyboards from the accordion all over it? She actually had the dress made special when she found the fabric. So you can create juxtapositions like that. And why did I photograph this? Because it was there. <laughs> It was an a, a auto truck stop in Morocco, and it was just wacky wild, and it's the wash station for outside the restrooms. And I just loved it for all the little sinks and the little soap dish, and then this crazy reflection that was in the mirror. Lens babies. David mentioned that, okay? Clarifying the vision might be, you know, using a special lens or some technique that you want to create the picture that you envision, okay? So there's a little bit of that pre-thought going on here. So mix song is more that reflective, reactive photography. Now you're starting into clarifying the vision and what tools can you use to make that happen. It might be that you're going to put on your macro, go extreme macro, my 100 macro plus a 500 D um, to get in close enough to be able to abstract this flower and mostly out of focus except for the drop and have that become more painterly. And it looks more like a chalk pastel now instead of being a photograph, you know, just by going extreme macro. You might want to create an impression of a moment, and often an impression is going to be something that's more abstracted. So panning with this mother and her uh, offspring through the field just allowed me to capture the energy of them running and create this more abstract impression of the scene. Imagination is more important than knowledge, and it's really about asking yourself, what if? 
and then going from that answer. Well, what if I panned on the landscape in the Palouse? Instead of getting the straight F-16 gorgeous shot, which I've already done in you know many years of going there, what if I just moved the camera? And figuring out whether typically I move the camera up for a lot of things, what if I moved it horizontally on a landscape? Would that work? And I was very pleased with the results here. Again, an impression of the rolling hills and the farm fields there. Same thing, a beautiful sky. I just panned on the sky with a slow shutter speed. And the numbers, the formulas aren't going to matter. We'll talk later about that, but you know, it depends on what lens you've got on, whether a 13th is going to work or whether you need to go to an eighth of a second to get the, the look that you want. So, but it's just thinking about it, thinking about things for this afternoon that you might try that you haven't tried. Take, I always wanted to be a painter, and I can't paint to save my life, but I can use my camera as a painter's tool now by using some slow shutters and some different techniques. So that's what this part is here. I'm getting this in front because often I run out of time, and then people don't get to, to talk or see about these things. So you can ask questions about this later. These are just vertical pans on trees. I love, I'm doing a whole series on trees in the forest to create that abstraction. And so these are different scenes in winter and in spring. And they don't all work, but I try it all the time. And I have to do several of them to get one that really works. I'm looking for composition still, and I'm looking for creating some depth in the picture. This still has some depth, a feeling of it, even though it's abstracted. And then I try moving the camera not so straight and maybe wiggling a little bit to try and f make it feel more like dancing, dancers. Maybe this is no longer about trees. So this is really stretching out there. But through all of that, I'm just playing and I'm experimenting and seeing what, uh, what I find works for me. So because of that, when I was in Cuba, I started thinking, well, what about doing that on the city streets? And in, in the city of New York would be great. There was a, a guy, I can't remember his name, but um, his pictures were not pans, but they, and the entire series was out of focus. And they were in the Bonnie Ben Rubin Gallery, I think that's the name of it, Bonnie Ben Rubin Gallery. And they were selling for seven, ten thousand dollars $10,000. And they were huge prints on the wall, and there wasn't one thing in focus in them. And I thought, I've got this wrong. I've been doing F11, <laughs> F16, the F8 and B there, you know, really trying to get something sharp in the picture. But you got it. You walked in, and since you looked at the pictures typically about 10 feet away to get them all in your peripheral, you, uh, you said, oh, rainy day in Manhattan, taxi cabs lined up, people walking with umbrellas, buildings, you got it. And so that, it taught me a lesson. It's like, maybe it doesn't all have to be in focus. Maybe I can abstract, but the out of focus isn't as easy as you think. I had a little bit better luck with movement in my attempt to, to go abstract. But it's, uh, you know, it's just thinking outside the box and playing. This is a, a bunch of scarves in Santa Fe in a shop. And I just love the colors. And we, I was talking with a student. And I said, well, what if we just panned on these scarves and created some texture and some color? You know, What about stained glass? I was inside a, a friend's church. And I loved the light coming through the stained glass. But as a straightforward shot of the stained glass, you know, it had a lot of religious motifs and, and stories and things like that. And it was beautiful. But it was a straightforward, predictable image. So I did whatever I did with those. And then, you know, in terms of making those pictures, and then I just said, well, I just like the colors. I like the movement. I like the glow. So I started experimenting. I used my lens baby. I did panning on it. I tried multiple exposures. One came out OK, but it didn't really get to where I wanted it to go. So this is the one that I ended up being the happiest with. But as I was doing these, I was looking at a compositional element. This little white Y, for me, creates a focal point in the picture. It's abstract, but your eye goes up, and it, there's, a, there's a, a shape to that that just makes it stand out a little bit. And it feels right for me to have something in the picture like that sometimes. Now, I mentioned multiple exposures. Not all our cameras can do that in camera, unfortunately. 
Um, so if you can't do it in camera, you have to make each picture and then put them together in the computer, which is more tedious. But if you can make multiple exposures in your camera, or if you don't mind sitting at the computer, that's another way to create an impression of something, an impression of flowers. Today, especially, if the trees are blooming and there's other flowers and textures out there, it may be a chance for you to experiment with that process. And especially if you can see the results in camera, it's really exciting because otherwise you never really know. So these are, uh, the first one was um, 32 exposures, and this was uh, eight exposures. And in this one, rather than moving randomly, so I got overlap stippled effect, this one I just moved vertically um, up the aspen trees so that it would give you a stippled effect, but a little bit more structure to the scene. And then there's days when it rains, and you're sitting in your car, and you're thinking, how wet do I want to get to run from the car to that house? <laughs> and then you just realize, you know, these could be some fun pictures, just looking, waiting for the window to pull up and have the water, you know, run down, and all the different textures and things that can happen with that. So, you know, while you're waiting for the rain to stop, there's pictures that you can make inside your car looking out. My first attempt at this was a very successful picture I did many years ago. I was waiting in my car and somehow my eyes focused on the passenger window and it was a light mist and you know when it mists really lightly the water beads up on the, the glass and before it had a chance to run, gather too much and run down, I saw bicyclists coming down a curvy road through that scene and my brain got it and I said if I focus on the window the bikes will be out of focus, but if I use the right aperture, I'll be able to have them in there and the story will be there. And then I just had to wait for somebody in a bright color, like yellow or you know, not navy blue, so that they would pop out of the scene, which didn't, I didn't have to wait too long. <clears throat> okay, why didn't that go? There we go. Okay, for some of you, how many of you love to work on the computer and do special effects and things with your pictures? All right, come on, be honest. Hands up. All right. A good, a good amount of you. And, and I enjoy it. I have come to learn that I'm more of a straight shooter, and you'll see that with a lot of my work. But I have really had some fun exploring, putting textured layers over images and creating a feeling that's different than the straight shot, which was nice enough. But by putting a texture layer, and I use flypaper textures, which I really enjoy, but there's others out there too. Um, I just think that it takes it to another level. Now, not a lot of people can envision what they want to do with their picture afterwards, and there's so many options out there that it can be overwhelming. So that's part of where I'm at, where I know that there's opportunities for me to create this effect with a lot of my images, but I don't want a cookie cutter approach. So I kind of want to respond to each image and, and think about what I might want to do with it. So these were just experiments at using the computer to further my creative vision. But you still want a good picture to start with. No matter what you do to it in the computer, chances are if it's a bad composition, if it's bad light and so forth, the picture's not really going to be saved by putting an arty effect on it. And I think we all know that. So these were all little techniques that I did in the computer, very subtle, some glamour glow from the Google NIC collection of Color Effects Pro. And it was just a touch of it to give it a little bit more of a soft, dreamy effect to that. This was done on my phone, and then and, and it took a long time working on the phone because it's a small real estate. But I used uh, I forget the app now, but I used one that was like the the smudge tool in Photoshop, where you can just push things around, and Liquify does that too. And I just moved it around. I used to do Polaroid manipulations. And anybody who's my age might remember Polaroid SX-70s and manipulating those things, right? Um, and, they, you know, and those are gone. But I still like that look. But this took like two hours to do on the phone. Now I have an iPad. I could work on it a lot easier if I want to go that route. So there were presets. Lots of things that, that I used um, through Lightroom, negative clarity was used on this. And then I, think I, and then I threw the sepia on it maybe from Nick. But again, I'm pretty much a straight shooter, so more often than not, I'll either work with straight color and process my image to look the best it can, or I'll go to monochrome, and I do like black and white. 
So I'm using both Topaz black and white effects and Silver FX Pro from Nick, uh, Google Nick, and really loving both of them for different things. I might tone my image a little bit. This has just a little bit of toning to it to just give it a little different look. But I'm just, I'm pretty much, this is what you see. I'm a straight shooter responding to the moment of beauty that I see wherever I am. And if I'm, you know, spending all that time in front of the computer, I'm not a happy camper. I want to be out doing this kind of photography and just straightforward going for the magic light, everything that I can. And I think most of us in this room, even if we do like to play a little bit, are still really wanting to make pictures that people understand that people get. When you get too far out into the abstract realm that they don't know what they're looking at, you, f you lose some audience, you know? So it's a personal thing, but I think that uh, it's for me just about straightforward as best as I can in the camera and with the basic processing. Mastering the craft, okay? This is not just, again, it's not technical today, but there's the other side of mastering the craft, which is about the seeing process, about composition and so forth. So <clears throat> we're going to talk about learning to see light, learning to compose creatively, incorporating visual design, creating visual depth, learning expressive techniques, which I talked about a little bit already. And we'll do more of that in the field where it's easier. And then capturing gesture and moment. Okay, And we'll talk about light right now. Because as George Eastman said, light makes photography. Where would we be without it? Embrace it, admire it, love it, but above all, know it. Know it for all your worth and you will know the key to photography. And it really is about that. You need to work with the appropriate light. It's not all about great sunrise and sunset light. It's about the appropriate light. It's about using light and recognizing that light creates the opportunity, okay? Light created the opportunity in both of these cases to have some really cool silhouettes and neat shapes and everything going on. And it's the opposite of what we might be doing. We're looking usually for a spotlight on our subject. Well, here's the opposite. The wall's lit and the tree is not, and yet the tree is still the subject. So it's using light in that concept in reverse. It illuminates your subject, in this case, backlighting. Backlighting is beautiful. We may have an opportunity for some of that this afternoon, I'm sure, if, if the sun stays out full like it is, OK? It can make some of your less exciting objects, such as a lampshade, look pretty darn exciting with the magic of light and the light coming through mini blinds. So here, I didn't even leave my living room, you know, and I'm making something that's interesting out of nothing, really. It's an everyday object. So if you start paying attention to the light and you see how it illuminates your subject, you start getting it and you say, ah, whether it's color or black and white, look at the tonality, look at the contrast of the light, look at how the light is illuminating your scene or your subject, okay? The, the passing clouds were creating dappled light in Tuscany and just highlighting that one little field and the farmhouse and the tree just enough to create some interest, having a little shade and then having the light again back here created some nice patchwork feeling in the image. Get creative with your light, okay? There's front light, there's side light, there's back light, and so forth and so on. But think about your subject. Think about a way that you can use the light to make something different. Now, in Cuba, this guy had rolled cigars for our group, and he, it was beautiful bounce light all, from this door and from the ground. It was bouncing in and lighting him up really well. And so everyone was taking their turn and getting some shots of him at the table, either rolling or smoking. And then he stood up. And as he stood up, when everybody was done, I realized that there was an opportunity to use the silhouette in the door and just waited for him to exhale so that there was a little bit extra gesture in that. So you want to really think about how you can use the light that you've got. Because when we go out this afternoon, it may not be the perfect time for outdoor photographers where we want morning or late afternoon light. We're going to have mid-afternoon light, OK? So your challenge is to work with the light you have, whatever it is. If it's cloudy or sunny, if it's sunny, you're going to have to pay attention to the contrast. Make contrast work for you if you can. This was an idea I had of taking the exposure down deliberately and creating a feeling more of moonlight. 
Okay, so it was just underexposing the scene to, you know, a daylight scene to make it feel more like it was moonlight. Whereas if it had been moonlight, the whole thing would have been blurred because I wouldn't have been able to get the sharpness and the, the, there's little uh, starbursts in there from my aperture. Remember that light expresses a mood also. The color of light often adds to that mood. So, you know, sunrise and sunset with all those rich colors can be really uplifting and it's, it's exciting kind of light to work with and dramatic when you've got great clouds like this and reflecting colors off the water. But it can also express a somber, scary, stormy mood. And storms in particular are great for capturing that mood of the day, the drama of the day. There is a magic of quiet light. And it's really funny that we love a bright sunny day, but our pictures do not often work really well in that bright sunny day. That so many of our photographs work best in that quieter, more diffused light because it enables us to see all the details in the shadow areas. And there's an energy to that light that's important. Full sun is strong energy, harsh contrast, and it works for certain things. Quiet or diffused light is about that softness and about the quietness and about allowing us to see all the details and there's a different energy to the light. So there's an appropriate light for your subject. This would not work in full sun, okay? It's great light for people. And in full sun, she would not have worked out well. Now she's got tremendous bounce light coming in from the light colored dirt. She's under a little covered porch, but the bounce light coming in was just incredible on her. And it evened the lighting out, but still gave some shadows, some soft definition to her face, okay? This image would not work in full sun because all of the details would have been lost in the high contrast that you'd have in a sunny situation. And as it is, it's really hard to see the name. We can't read it, but we get that it's a tombstone wrapped by those beautiful azaleas, and that's all you need. In full sun, you couldn't see it. So I just had to wait for a passing cloud to be able to get that image. A hillside like this, you want to be able to almost count the leaves on the trees. You know, you want to see all the detail, you want to see the skeleton of the bare trees, and you can't do that in high contrast light. So again, a cloudy day or waiting for a cloud to pass over the sun gives you that opportunity, and it's, and it's still vibrant, all the colors are there, in fact more so because the light is diffused. And often the bigger landscape, when it gets to be flat light, a lot of times, you know, we say, oh, well, it's not really great light for the landscape. And in certain situations, that's absolutely true. And in a lot of situations, you'll notice I'm not including sky, because if it is an overcast day, the white sky isn't really great. So you try to minimize the sky or get it out completely and just work with the effect of the diffused light. Then you've got very soft, sort of not quite diffused, but not full sun either. And that working in that kind of light can be really special because it just, it just creates a warmth to the light. It's, this was at sunrise, but the contrast is manageable. And, they, and it, it projected pretty well up there. Sometimes I'm worried that those ones that are on the edge, the darks just go away, but they're looking good. So this is also bounce light. That's one type of light that people don't really use all that much. And if you're paying attention to the light, you're gonna see that the light sidewalk is kicking light up into somebody's face when they're in the shade. You won't see it if they're out in the sun, but if you move somebody into the shade and they're right next to a bright sunlit sidewalk, there's gonna be that bounce light kicking up, uh, or maybe a wall out here that will kick up light. You have to pay attention to the color, because if it's a red wall, they're gonna have reflected red light on their face, so it needs to be somewhat neutral. But, you know, the bounce light is really great. I was in a canyon in Zion National Park, and it was basically open shade. But when the sun hit some of the canyon walls, it bounced light down into the wash. So that little bit of bounce light created a, enough contrast to create the texture that you see in this picture and the dimension of it, the leaves. And if you, if you just shoot in open shade, it's often really flat and I don't care for that look as much as I care for using the bounce light. So just paying attention to light. 
There are times the big scene, you need the full sun. And dappled light works great here because you've got little bits of spotlight. The guy's shirt is lit up a little bit, but he's not blasted by light. And there's just little pockets of light adding to the, the interest in that picture. This, you could not make this shot without the sun. The pattern's still gonna be there, but you're not gonna see that incredible pattern on the sand dunes if you don't have the light to bring that out. So it's again, just knowing what is the appropriate light for the scene that's right in front of me. And on a cloudy day, you typically don't go out to the sand dunes. You just do other things. You do <laughs> macro details of the little plants that are coming up in the, in the desert or something, you know, or you go have four cappuccinos and wait for the light. <laughs> but you, know, you just start to get to know. And Elliot Porter once said that, and I'm paraphrasing like mad, um, is that you know you figure out the if you just keep photographing you figure out what works and what doesn't work and you figure out light you figure out what you need for a situation to work you realize that yes this could have been a beautiful portrait of him without the sun but wow that sun made this really great shadow and isn't that a fun way to have this this depth to the picture to have both. You recognize that in storm light, it might be a cloudy day and you're thinking, maybe I'll just go back to bed. But if you make that walk out to the overlook, it just might break through the clouds and you get this incredible spotlight effect on the cliffs and your, your own ridge you're on creates the shadow beneath you and you've got this wonderful storm cloud in the sky. And it's a magic moment that you can't ever predict. So you just get up and you go, even if it's cloudy. And you get out and you stay out in storms if they're not threatening to kill you with lightning. I waited for the storm to pass, but um, it was out there in Monument Valley and I was safe where I was. And we all came out of our little campers and our cars to set up our tripods after we felt it was safe enough. you know. But if you're not there, if you think, oh my gosh, it's really stormy and it looks like it's gonna rain, I'm gonna go inside, then you're missing the moments. So you get camera protectors for all of the different cameras. There's lots of different choices. I think there's probably a few for sale in the store here, <laughs> as a matter of fact, um, more than I could probably have time to choose from. But you, you, know, you protect your camera, protect yourself, and then you can be out in the elements and you can have a great time. So we're up in a tower, it, it's about to pour on us, and I'm just excited about this dramatic cloud in Trinidad, and it's raining over there, you can see the sheet coming down, and then we got the rain. And so we were protected inside, but I was able to stand out on the balcony and make that picture. I, got it. I made the class get out in this wet snowstorm, but we were in, Yellow, in uh, Yosemite, and I was in the middle of critique, and I looked outside, and I said, oh my gosh, we have to go now, because it was a, a freak May snowstorm, and I wanted to be able to get everybody out there while it was sticking to the trees, because I knew it wouldn't stick for long if it warmed up even once it stopped. So you create this magic, and we grabbed the trash bags from our hotel room garbage cans, those of us that didn't have protection, they're real thin, but they work and, and it was perfect. And everybody kept their cameras dry and we had a great time. And, and I think probably six of the students made Christmas cards out of their pictures from this afternoon shoot because it was, it was just perfect snow conditions. So, <clears throat> oh, and I wanna back up for a minute. It may be a little hard to see, but you can see it's snowing. And so I had to experiment to choose a shutter speed that was gonna give me the texture of the snow you know, that, that added the look that I wanted to the picture. You could go with freezing it or you could go with letting it streak a little bit. And I chose the one that I liked the best was the one that streaked a little bit. So clearing storm. If you're out during the storms, um, then you're there when it starts to clear if you're lucky. Um, or maybe just after it passes, if you can get out there, you get great opportunities to capture the ambiance and the mood of the storm light. So all of these just speak to that. Working with atmospheric conditions of a foggy morning and a really still pond of water. And it, you know, all of these provide great opportunities to make your pictures more dynamic. Okay, working those edges of the day where you've got the subtle, warm, cool contrast going on. You've got the cool of twilight, but the last vestiges is, oh boy, that's a tough one. I'm not even gonna try that again. Um, the last bit of sunset on the horizon. So that pink blue is a pleasing contrast for the brain. We like color opposites like that. And so working at that time of morning or evening is a great time 
to, to get out there and capture it. And I love that earth shadow where you've got that pink and blue banding in the sky. And this happened to be a full moon rising that night. So I'm in Capitol Reef, Utah, out in the Cathedral Valley. And I just positioned myself where the moon was going to be up with all the apps we have for our smartphones now. You know, you can know exactly where you need to stand. Then you just hope that it's going to be a clear night because you've made all this effort to get out there. <coughs> Working with in the cities with twilight and the artificial lights balanced against that twilight hour. You know, you've got a 15, 20 minute window once the sun's gone down where you can get this blue and the balance with the artificial lighting and then it's gone. You don't have to stop photographing at that point, but it changes into something else. This happened to be wet pavers in the front, and so that added some interest because it picked up some reflection and I let the cars streak and go by. But it's all about paying attention to the light, and when everybody else is going in to eat dinner, you just say, I'll see you later, because you know that there's some magical things that you can make if you stay out until really late. So when we're in Italy, we're eating 9.30, 10 o'clock at night, because the sun in May goes down by, I think, 8.30ish, and or 8.30 is twilight, and we don't want to miss that. But when it is gone completely, this was in Baltimore, you can still work with the dark of night. The East Coast is actually easier. There's a lot of light pollution and there's a lot of humid, uh, humidity haze and or dare I say it, smog and things that mean that the night sky is not as black as it might be when you're out in places that have cleaner air. So it's, it's, it actually was a benefit here because it enabled the, the smoke, the steam or whatever that was coming out of the factory to stand out and the buildings all stood out from the back and the light pollution itself from cities will mean that the sky isn't as black, but that helps the night pictures that you make. Otherwise, the building edges disappear if it's totally clear and there's not a lot of light pollution. And then when the moon comes up, stay out. So you just have to take pills to eat instead of eating any of your, you know, you just stay out forever. Um, it's the best way because you're in Yosemite and the sun goes down and it was a great sunset. And now we're heading off to dinner and I'm thinking, oh, I want to get out and do moonrise. Well, the good news in the valley is that you never get moonrise. You always have to wait like an hour or something before the moon shows above the canyon walls. So we got a quick dinner and then we went out and we photographed moonlit rocks and it was bright enough with the stars that we had to also get some star trailing. So it's you know all about light in just that section, but I, couldn't, I can't speak enough about the magic of light and the appropriate light for your subject and to be thinking about that. Okay, so dynamic compositions. Strong composition is when the raw materials of light, shape, line, etc., are arranged in a meaningful way and so give impact to the photograph. Okay, now is when your job really comes in again. Okay, you've got great light or the appropriate light. You've got great subject material in front of you, but you've got to compose it. You've got to arrange it in a way that's going to have impact in the end result so that when I see your picture, I get it and I say, wow, you know, that just really hits just right. And it's really about subject position and balance, proportion and scale, and counterpoint. Now there's the rule of thirds. Many of you have been through a lot of seminars here and a lot of other classes, I'm sure. So this is not about the basic rule of thirds. Oh, I'm sorry, it is. <laughs> it has to be, right. But it's really subject position. I mean, we've learned the rule of thirds and I put the tic-tac-toe grid up there just as a reminder, okay? But you've got sort of these four points. If you're gonna stick to that rule of thirds idea, you've got four intersecting places where you could put your subject. You still have to decide which of those makes the most sense based on the situation. So for me, in this image, we typically enter a picture from left to right the way we read in this culture, okay? So we enter from the left, which means I'm bringing you up the stem of the red bud, and I bring you to the point where the old seed pod is attached, 
and, you, and that's in that upper third, and then it drops through the lower right third. And that is where you end. And it's the story about old and new, but composed in a way so that it gets you to that point, and you're seeing interesting things along the way, all the new buds. And then you look at the old pod, and you kind of say, well, shouldn't that be falling off by now? You know, And it will eventually go when the leaves and everything starts to come out. This is a good example where I flipped this. This is the way I shot it. I did it deliberately so that when you got to the focal point, which was the barberry with the little red berries in there, you were, all, you were moving across all the other little bits of the tundra plants. Somebody had asked me one time, well, what if you flipped it? So I did. And this is what you get. Now, it's in a rule of thirds, generally, area still. But now you come in and you land on it right away. And do you really have any reason to then go beyond it? Because it's a strong element in the picture. So there's a little bit of a tug of war. When you go off to the right, you're pulled back. So why not think about that ahead of time and say, OK, well, I'm going to put it in that upper right, because that feels good. And I'll leave enough space to have all these other little bits in there that your eye sees as it's traveling to the final destination. OK? And that's just how I thought about that picture. In this case, finding a leaf on the stones, you could compose this in so many different ways. But I was, again, thinking about the comfortable entry into a picture is upper left, reading left to right, top to bottom. So you come in in that upper left area, you get onto the leaf, and you follow the leaf and the stem down through the picture. And the background supporting rocks is just that. It's the background. The leaf is the star. The leaf is your focal point. But I want to move you through my frame. I, and so again, you know, flipping this, and I didn't do that for an example here, or we'll be here all day, but flipping this didn't work because of that angle. It just felt comfortable to have this composed this way, and then thinking about the space around it. And you want to do that all the time. You want to think about the space, the negative space against the positive space. In this case, the that's not so much negative, but the stone space versus the leaves on the tree. How much stone do I want versus tree? You know, what's my story here? And what really drew me was the juxtaposition of these branches against the soft orange of the rocks in Zion. So I had to decide just how much rock felt right for me so that the tree was still the focus, the tree was still the subject. If I gave too much more space to the rock, then the rock became the focus because it was solid and it was an empty, a more empty space. So that alone made it grab your attention. So you have to be thinking about that when you're composing. And the more you do it, the more quickly you get to that intuitive point where you just have a gut feeling, ah, that feels right. So examine it, look at it different ways, and just pay attention to what in your gut level feels right when you look at it. Now, this has a lot of space around it, but it's a bird flying. You've got to leave room for the bird to fly into that space, OK? And it was just this clear blue. And I didn't want it so tight to the frame with the wingtips. It's on a nice angle. So I've got room for it in that upper right area for the bird to fly. And that's a critical use of that positioning again. Now, they're flying. And some people have said, well, how are you doing that when you're just tracking and trying to keep the bird in the frame, period? You know, if you practice follow focus and tracking flying objects, running objects, you know, you get better and better at framing as you're going and knowing that you're keeping them in the position where you want them. Or you shoot a little wider and you might have to crop later, but it's typical to get them in the middle because you're using that center point for focus, and then we end up compositionally with them dead center in our frame. So try not to do that. This also has a lot of empty, simple space around her. What drew me was that she's wearing clothing that matches her wall. You know, it's like, it can't, doesn't get any better than that, really. And I liked that she was just looking out her window and she didn't see me. So I'm on an angle such that she, you know, she, the angle that she's looking, I've given her space on that right side to do that. OK? And that's an important consideration in the quick moment, because I'm trying to get the picture before she sees me, just because then if she looks at me and she smiles or frowns or whatever, I've missed this moment. So you, know, you, you have to be intuitive about it. 
and that only happens if you just constantly photograph. When you've got something like this, you can play. I've got verticals, horizontals, I've got the circle on the right, I've got the circle on the left, I've got it filling the frame, I've got it really teeny in the frame, you know, and I just had fun with it. And this is just one example that I liked where it's off center, it's big enough to, you know, it's obviously the subject and it was surrounded by just simple uh, other elements. But I worked that situation like crazy because it had, you know, a lot of potential. Here, the subject is your cat, okay? But it's balanced by the door shapes and the other areas of the scene. So it gives a bit of a sense of place to it, a, a village that's quite blue, chef showing in Morocco. But the cat is clearly your subject. Now, it, it isn't exactly rule of thirds here. You can see I'm outside of that zone. That's okay. It's just about position and balance and the proportion of everything there. This man was walking up to the mosque, and I love the graphics of the staircase just by itself, but I thought it needs a human. It needs something in there besides just the graphics. And lo and behold, without waiting too long, here comes a man wearing a nice color against the wall, and I just captured him in that position. I, I actually kept shooting, but what happened when he was here is I didn't like him splitting this up. It, it, when he got in be behind that part of the railing, it broke that edge. And I really liked this feeling sort of like a stock chart, you know, hopefully the way our charts are going. And, and so I needed him to either be before it or after it. And when he was after that spot, he was too much in the middle. So, you know, all of this is going on in my head as I've already set this up. I've already seen the scene, and Sam Abel taught me to do this many, many years ago when I took a class with him in 1982. He talked about finding a background, finding a situation, and then waiting for everything to come together. Now, it doesn't always work. He went back to one street corner four days in a row to get the shot and waited maybe an hour or two each day. We don't all have the luxury of doing that. But if you do try to do that and you get a shot that you really like and you can go revisit it, you'll have opportunities where the right scenario will present itself. And you've already got your composition figured out, you know? So here the lines of the cracks in the mud are drawing us from the lower left up to the leaf. The leaf is the star, the subject here. But the background is equally important because it's all about the parched earth of the desert. And the fact that the leaf is decaying and is pretty soon going to be invisible because it's becoming the color of the earth that it's dissolving into. I didn't have much choice with this one because the guy, when I asked if I could make his picture, he just stopped and he posed. And I said, well, I guess that's the picture then, you know? And, and I did other photographs too, but that was classically the, the stance. And I thought, well, okay, so I've got to get the gun tip in there. That means he's automatically got to be on the left. And I just left enough room so that I wasn't touching the gun tip to the edge. I didn't want too much space because then I had a door jam that was in there. So, you know, you're wiggling it out of that little space you have to work with, and that's the best you can get out of the shot. But it so worked that he, you know, he was off center that way. You can't always do that with people, but I try to. These two girls, the sisters, were just darling. And I deliberately kept them off center just to make it more dynamic and not so static. You know, the same thing here. He's not dead center. Now, there's a lot of symmetry in this kind of a situation with the umbrellas, the parasols, and I could have lined him up and had the parasol ribs radiating out from behind him, and I could have had him centered and done the whole symmetry thing, but I didn't want that. So I like the fact that it is slightly off center and off symmetry with the parasol, and that to me makes it more dynamic. So that's a personal taste. There's Richard Mizrak has made a career out of horizons in the middle, dividing the space equally in a lot of the work that he does. So who am I to say that that's wrong? But I think we like asymmetry more than symmetry. We're, we're always aiming to achieve balance in our lives, but it's not about static balance. It's about balance with a little bit of tension, a little bit of asymmetry. So here's a situation where 
the, the walls in Trinidad are painted quite often, you know, they, they're the, a bottom color and then a top color. And I find this woman walking up with her fish and I'm really excited and I want it to be an anonymous picture. It's not about her, it's about the fish that she's got on these strings. So I ask her if I could photograph her with just her fish. So she holds them and then I'm struggling because I'm seeing this line and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, do I go up or down? And if I, I as I was moving, I was getting more of her, you know, and I finally said, you know what? But if she's off center left and right, even if that division in the wall is somewhat even, her body breaks all that up. So just go with it and relax because she's also on her way to sell these things and she doesn't want them baking before she gets to where she's selling them. So I can't take as much time as I might like to have her, maybe I put her on an angle, you know. So I just have to work with what I've got quickly. But if you can just get one axis off center, you can save your day sometimes, you know, uh, when you've got a situation like that. But there's times when the symmetry makes it beautiful. And that's this case here. It's not quite, you know, where exactly is the shoreline in this to say it's exactly even. But, you know, I try to create the symmetry of the reflection and the reality in this image. But the yellow, you'll notice that this yellow, the way this curves, see my pointer disappears up there, and here mimics. And so there's motion from left to right. The eye comes in and it hits the boulders, but the yellow takes us off and it takes us off with some movement because of the reflection and the way it sort of splays out. That's because yellow is such a strong color. If it were greenery, you wouldn't have that effect, or blue flowers, maybe not the same, but the yellow really does the job. Now, if you look at this, the implied horizon line, if you can see my pointer, is right at the feet, okay? Basically, I've divided the frame. But it's really subtle because there's no obvious line. It's just where they're standing, and one of them isn't standing at that same plane, if you will. So, uh, and it had to be what it was because I just loved the reflection in the ripples that you could see through the water and this little moment. And so you can't always be overthinking it. Sometimes you just have to, you know, make the best of the situation that you can compositionally. And think about not being afraid of empty space. There's a lot of space around this it leaf. Okay, but I don't think anybody here would argue the leaf is still the subject. The leaf is still the star. So why does that work? Well, it works because there's a calmness to this image. Okay, there's no reflecting ripples. There's just this smoothness. And the serenity of the moment is expressed by space by the visual space that I've given to this so that all of the water around it is smooth and calm and, and so you don't have any reason to go anywhere except to be surrounded by the blue and the blue in contrast with the orange leaf is a pleasing color contrast so the eye looks at this and just goes ah oh, that's nice and it's relaxing if there were ripples in the picture they would draw your eye away from the leaf and I'd be trying to compose tighter to get rid of ripples but in this case it was just it was so even and you can see a hint of something but you're not sure if you're looking into the bottom of the water or if it's maybe clouds reflecting so it's just a hint of texture in there that adds some interest but doesn't distract. Now this is where it gets more interesting because it's more complex. When you're in a real world situation and you're walking down the streets in Myanmar and you want to photograph and you think, okay, well, how am I going to do this? I want this guy, I've got my wide angle lens on and I'm looking at his scene. I'm trying to minimize background distractions and I've got a triangle, if you can see my pointer, but his face, his honeycomb in the basket and the box here. Those three elements are what you move around that tell the story about the bee vendor, the honey vendor, okay? And so that's more of a triangular kind of composition, moving the eye through the frame to different areas that tell the story. Here you go to the, the older girl's face first, and then you sort of drop down in the clothing and it's sort of a circular movement that takes you to the child's face. It's very subtle because there's, you know, if I drew lines up there then you might see that more. But it's just be thinking about it when you're framing up even people. Looking at what you're including in the frame and, and getting rid of as much as you can. So I tried as best as I could to get rid of all the distractions of all the other people behind her and just fill the frame as much as I could with her and her baby sister and the fabric that she was wrapped in. 
<coughs> Excuse me, just one minute here. Okay, a little bit more complex here, but now we're talking about counterpoint, okay? You've got this creation, the juxtaposition of the two, and, and the story that that tells, which is basically the story of tradition in Cuba. The man's outside having a smoke, and, you know, she's inside doing housework. She opens the door, and she peeks out for just a minute, and she sees me, and I get the shot, and then I smiled at her, and she smiled back. So I thought, okay, whew, I'm all right, because I wouldn't be caught dead, you know, <laughs> coming to the door with, you know, rollers and this. But, you know, she was fine with it. But then three or four other people with me saw the opportunity, and all the lenses went like this, and she, shut, she went in and shut the door. So then she got self-conscious about it, but she was okay with me. It was that one-on-one -on -one moment that I had. But I liked that relationship. He is the subject, but she is equally important in the story here. Same thing here, okay? The guy by himself would be great with the pig, okay? <laughs> the pig's head. Um, I mean, he would be fine. But when he stopped for me, the woman in the back just adds another story, another layer, okay? And I'm always looking for those layers and in, in making them work. And so I like that they're leaning opposite directions, the way she's leaning versus him, and they split apart. I made very sure that they weren't running into each other compositionally, no mergers of arms and legs and so forth. <clears throat> and it was a brief moment, and then he was off because he had to get the pig's head somewhere. <laughs> so, so that counterpoint or juxtaposition, all right? And it's a funny kind of definition with counterpoint that I, I'm always on thin ice when I try to explain it, but visually I think you get the idea that clearly he is the subject, but you wouldn't know who he is without that piece of meat hanging back there, and now you kind of get a story about him. So there's that, that counterpoint or that juxtaposition of the two, but keeping it out of focus because we don't want to see the gory bits, you know, anyway, um, the, the focus is on him, and clearly an environmental portrait that works, okay? The subject is the guy, but look at all the hats and the pattern, and pattern is really strong, so he becomes sort of a counterpoint to all of that around him. He, and you know, and it's, it's really interesting, and he looked up for just a brief moment. The rest of the time, he kept wanting to look off other directions. <clears throat> he was not a very, uh, he was willing to be photographed, but not really willing to be posed, you know. So here we've got this situation. I just love the, the taxi, the, the red and the white and the yellows and everything. And I've deliberately framed this tightly. I wanted the angle to move off to the right. And now you're moving off to the right with the car, but you're pulled back to her. She happened to be just in a good position. She's wearing red instead of blue and orange and whatnot. And it was just one of those moments. And she looks like she's waiting for something and that kind of played off that theme of the taxi. <clears throat> in composition, you also need to be thinking about scale. If you can express how tall something is or how small it is, how large and so forth, then that's adding something to your image. And that requires relationships to, from the subject to other things. So in this case, you get this feeling that either that's a very tiny tree or it's a very tall cliff wall, and it is. It's El Capitan in uh, Yosemite. And that tree is probably 60 feet, 80 feet tall, okay? But it doesn't look tall here. It's just overpowered by that wall. So there's a sense of scale that's going on there. Here too, if you want to really express how large the face of a glacier is, when you're st if you've stood there and you know, the only way to do it is to put something in the frame that we have a reference that we get. We know the relative size of a person, so now we say, wow, holy cow, that's a big wall of ice, you know. Now it's furthered, uh, em further emphasized by compression with a telephoto. So that adds to it. But I didn't want to go, I had to make the decision, I didn't want to go any larger than she was because then I thought it was not going to have the scale that I wanted. And I was lucky that she was wearing a red jacket that they had loaned her from the boat. So that made her a great point of contrast, <coughs> OK? Here, the monks would, we, they're rent-a-monks. Um, <coughs> but because you go places, the monks aren't always there. And so my, our guide will make sure that there's a few monks there for us so that if we <laughs> want to work the monks into the scene, we can. I mean, at first I balked at that because I thought, oh my gosh, that is just too, 
it's just so not right, you know. <laughs> but there were several things that came out of my, my enlightenment on that trip, and that was that <coughs> the young boys in particular, they're willing to do it. They have the opportunity and the right to do it when they're young and they're, you know, they haven't made their complete adult vows into the monastery. And so, you know, they make a little extra money and it feels really good for them that they get some extra money. And they're very willing and they like to talk with us and exchange with us too. But you have the option to photograph just the ruins or put people in the scene if you wish. And <coughs> let's face it, if we're traveling with a group of tourists that look like me, you don't want me in your picture for a sense of scale, typically. You want something that really expresses place. And so having monks uh, or girls wearing their traditional clothing in the scene really adds to the picture. So you get a feeling of how tall and big that mass of rock is with the, the temple facade on it when you've got people in there. So in composition, work that situation. Think about horizontals versus verticals. Both of them work, but they use the space differently. And why not shoot them both now and decide later? That's the way I look at it. And that came from my stock photo days, too. And still, now, I will look at it horizontally. I'll look at it vertically. And if I can make both, I'll do both, because um, they have better use in the stock photo market but they express something different. In this one, I've got Alcatraz in there and beautiful reflections in the Chrissy Field estuary area. And this one is basically the same except Alcatraz is missing, okay? Can't fit it in unless I widen the view in the vertical. And I, it's a different framing, but still working with the, basically the same elements of the estuary and the colors of the sky. This was a, a master violin shop in Florence, and we got permission to go and meet with them. And this is the son, his father is in the poster behind him. So this is the big view. This is the story of their shop with all of the forms, and he's at work on some violins. And then you just keep working it. You get closer. You keep asking yourself, what can I do? Oh, well, now he's picking it up, and he's, gonna, he's painting a little varnish on it. So I'll get in a little closer, and I'll show the jars of varnish. I still have some back background in there, and then what if I get in tighter, simplifying, okay? This picture is strong on its own. This picture works on its own, and so does this one. They're all right answers to the same situation, and I just, I just keep working until they're kicking us out, you know? It's time to go to the next thing. You want to think about point of view to make your pictures more dynamic. I see so many people go out with their tripod, and they set the tripod up for standing height. And that is a static approach. Now, it may be an OK picture from standing height. Maybe getting low isn't going to benefit you in that situation. But be thinking about getting low, getting high, looking down. This picture was cleaned up. It's, it's downtown Havana. But looking from the 17th floor down to the street below with a telephoto lens, I could capture a story of the old cars and a design element of the road um, and all the painted lines on it. This was from a tannery overlooking the vats in Fez, Morocco. And, and, you know, and it just has a sort of biblical feel because this has been going on for so many thousands of years. And the way the light was that day really added to it, too. But that elevated view gives me a view into the vats. If you're street level, which I thought I wanted to be at first, you can't get in close enough to see any of the liquid, so you don't see the dye. You lose the story more. That elevated viewpoint does it. The school bus going through this narrow village, okay, and being elevated and looking down, I was able to capture the moment when it came around the bend and the bright yellow of it stood out. And I'll admit I enhanced the yellows just a little bit. But because it needed that, you know, because there were yellow houses too. So only the bus I enhanced. I didn't enhance the houses because I wanted it to sort of play off the yellow in the houses and be equal. Get down low. I'm on my stomach to get this shot and willing to get dirty. And it's a puddle that's maybe four by six, you know, it's not a big puddle. But when you get that close and low to it, you can make it look a lot bigger and you can just really capture a different feeling. With my wide angle, and this child was just sitting here in Bhutan working on his, his arithmetic, and I just tilt the camera down, which exaggerates the foreground, okay, and got in close enough that there's distortion going on here, but not 
uh, distractingly so, and it just creates a little bit more of a dynamic composition by doing that. Think about how you're leading the, pic the, the viewer, me, through your frame. Because the picture, when it's done, has to move us through to the things you want to show us. So this is a Cuban flower shop. And this is all they had to sell for that day. And to me, that was a story. It's like not the flower shops we know here in the city or in San Francisco. This is like, OK, I can only afford to buy this many. And hopefully, I'll sell them by the end of the day. And I have food, more food to eat. So I just use them and, and use them to line up the way they were lined up and lead you to this funky electrical box on the, the wall. And the whole thing is just saying, it screams, bare bones shop, you know? They work with what they've got down there. And I think it's really impressive. So here, the monk had come up the stairs that are behind him. He turned to take in this wonderful morning with great clouds. I loved the shadow pattern and the way the railing curved. And he was the element that I needed. The whole scene was really lovely, but I needed something more in there. And I was blessed, no pun intended. But when he came up the stairs and he stopped, I went, <gasps> you know, and I got three frames. And then he started to walk away. And I asked him if he would go back. And then I worked the scene a little bit differently. But this is the one I ultimately ended up loving. You're right, it does get cold in there. <clears throat> OK, so leading the eye. OK, this is a tree on Olmsted Point in Yosemite. And I have photographed this tree so many times with workshops. Anytime I go through the park on the way from the west to the east side of California, I stop, take a break at Olmsted. If it's the right light, I'll play around. And one day, after 10 or 12 times through this area, I walk down below it. And I looked, and I saw these cracks in the granite that just drew you up. And I got low and close and just used those lines to bring you up to the tree, OK? And, and it was just that. It was just a different way. And it proved the point. No matter how many times I had been there, there was still one more way to see it differently. And I'm not done yet. And um, you know, it's, when you think about it, Painters do that all the time. They'll go out and paint the same haystack, the same field. You know, Monet painted 50 times, I think, he painted the same haystacks. And he got 50 different looks because he was exploring and seeing more deeply each time. OK? So now you come in the top left, and you kind of stair step down the three blossoms to the bud. And the bud is just in the frame, so you're not running off the edge of the frame. Close, but you know, given what I had to work with, this is the framing that I had to have. It was tight, but I could pull it off so that you stop on the bud. And, and it's just thinking about how the eye is going to move through the frame. Now, some might argue that you're going to come in from the bottom and go up. But I would think more often, you come in upper left, and you jump from the upper symbols to the next one and the bottom one in these um, tambourines. Couldn't think for a minute what they were. This is an example of that idea of, of moving the eye, OK? This is a missed moment. The shot before it was the moment. And I didn't include it, because again, I'm short on time always. But you know, if he's looking down at the guy working on his shoes, then you're going to look at the guy working on his shoes, OK? It's wherever humans are looking, we tend to look as well. So in this shot, I made the first one. And then the guy looked down the road. And so you come in and you see them right away. But then you look down the road. To what? There's nothing there. The story is them. I mean, there's depth to the scene. But there's just nothing going on back there. So you want to pay attention to that, because human beings in particular, we're going to follow where they're facing and where their eyes are going. And so animals the same way. OK, visual design. All right, we doing OK so far? I'm stuffing a lot in your heads, I know. But you're going to use it all this afternoon if you can remember it when you get out there. <laughs> so you'll hear my voice and remember it in months to come, years to come, with any luck. All right. So visual design is about lines and shape and form, pattern and rhythm, and texture. My original book, Creative Nature and Outdoor Photography, was really in depth about this topic and about light and composition. And it was revised in 2010 and to be uh, more up to date for digital. 
Okay, so we could breathe new life into the book, but co the concept of composition doesn't change whether you're film or digital. So the book still really works, and it's still out there for sale. And the store, you can order it through B&H. And if you want to get into this more in depth, that book is excellent. Brian, uh, it's called Creative Nature and Outdoor Photography. Um, my buddy Brian Peterson also has a lot of good books that we're like kindred spirits in the way we see and talk about this stuff. So lots of good information out there. This is going to be just a snippet, okay? But I love working with visual design elements when they're there, incorporating them to make a picture that's fun. There's times when lines are just screaming at you, and this doesn't take you anywhere except off the top of the frame, but it was just this incredible view of Provence fields of lavender, and the side lighting was creating this really interesting effect on the lines. So that's all this was, was me just responding to the graphics that were there. Ideally, I want you being taken somewhere, and later I'd find rows that took you to a little tree or a little house, you know, but this was just something about the light and the texture in that that was really fun. Then there's times when lines are more subtle. Now, when I, when I say line, you know, you think of like, is it a one pixel or a five pixel line, okay? That's the literal concept of a line. In photography, you will have lines like that here and there. But more often than not, they're going to be wider than a one or two pixel line in the computer. They're going to be bands of lines, like here. You've got several bands, if you will, of horizontal areas of your frame. So you've got this stacked layer of horizontal lines or horizontal bands. Okay, And that's how I use lines a lot more. Um, or maybe it's a road, and that road is quite wide, so it's, again, not a two-pixel line. It's a bigger line within the scheme of things. But horizontal lines are calming. They're relaxing. And if you frame them horizontally, they just add a more calm and, if you're not careful, static feeling to your picture. So horizontal framing is great. The cameras are still made to feel right when held horizontally. But remember to look at pictures vertically as well. Just pay attention to what the elements are in your frame. This didn't work as a vertical because I wanted that sweep of the trees and the way it disappears into the fog on the right and all of that to be surrounded by some empty space so that you got this feeling of serenity and tranquility in the scene. And a vertical just changed that feeling feeling for me. Okay, so I knew right then not to bother with the vertical. Same thing here. It's really bands. We've got the band of water, the band of fog, the little band of the trees, and then we've got the band that is the mountains and sky. So there's a lot of layering in this case of horizontal oriented lines. And then the orchid in there just add a visual point, you know, of focus. I take a lot of horizontal pictures of vertical things. And one might say, well, why not shoot a vertical subject vertically? And that's fine. But sometimes when you've got repetition, like I did here in the trees and fog, the horizontal framing gave me more visual space to set up that repetition, whereas the vertical showed the tallness of the trees, but it didn't give me that repetition. It didn't show the, you know, how the grove went on into the fog you know, and beyond. And so for that, the horizontal made sense, even though they were vertical subjects. When you went vertical, the tops of these cypress get really messy. All the branches and the leaves are up there. And it just was clumpy and visually heavy to have that in the frame. When I tried cropping that out, it just stunted the whole feeling for me in the picture. So you know if you were standing next to me exactly what I'm saying, and I'm sure you've had your own experiences where it just doesn't feel right to go with one format or the other. So there's no fast rule for that. You just look at the elements. The angle of all the lines, all these ridges in the sandstone that you see here, are what attracted me. It's just the rock ha has tilted on its side in this wash, and so the lines, that, which had been sediment layers, okay, now that it's tilted, they're all nicely oblique lines for me. And then the leaves were falling down off the trees and landing in the wash below. And because it's sandstone and it's nubby and gritty, a couple of them sort of just got stuck 
on some nubs, I guess, and then a very, very light dew or mist had you know, put water on them, and that was it. But they hadn't been knocked off with a heavy rain. So I liked how those leaves were sort of suspended on the rock. But it's all those lines that bring you from upper left to lower right repeatedly as you move through the frame. And the leaves break that up a little bit, but the the diagonal or oblique lines are really strong lines. They've got a lot of energy to them, so they can afford to be broken up. Now this, without the jawbone, would be nothing. I mean, yeah, it'd be a, a great example of oblique lines, again, sediment layers. But we were walking through this one area that we knew bighorn sheep traveled through a lot. We were looking for the sheep. Oh, I found the remains of sheep, which was just as exciting for me to be able to just photograph it and position it and have it sort of, you know, it was just l so nicely lined up with what was behind it. It was like somebody placed it there. I like to work with organic lines. And in nature especially, you don't have a lot of straight lines of anything. Man-made, there's a lot of angles, a lot of straight lines. But in nature, you've got a lot more organic lines. And so I look for ways to incorporate those. And again, Zion's a great place for lines in the sandstone. But this had this wonderful little S-curve and the way it traveled through, and a repetition of that, and then the leaves at the bottom. So a different take on that same idea of leaves in a wash. You know, just walking and walking and looking for things that catch your fancy. Using the scalloped edge of the water and the way it cascaded over in the Smoky Mountains, I converted it to black and white because it was basically sort of brown, black, and white. And I just didn't care for the brown in there, so I just converted it completely. But it was that scalloped edge that you see here that goes along that draws you through the picture, but while you're going along that edge, you're also looking at all the repetition of the lines as it spills over. So all of that adds visual design to the picture, okay? It's subtle, but it's all in there. I could have chosen other areas of the stream, but I felt that that really had something more going for it. Shape another element of design, all right? And the shapes of these dogwood bracts are really, really strong here. And I've got three, which is also good when you're including numbers. Many of you probably know that odd numbers are better than even numbers. And so I didn't pick this, I just uh, that's what was on the branch. And I said, thank you. It was perfect to have the three. And the shapes were so strong, I kept the background out of focus. But it was all about the shapes of the dogwood bracts, and they were just really fun. So shape often, because it's two-dimensional, it's often seen as a silhouette. We think of silhouetted shapes, OK? The dogwood was clearly not silhouetted, so, but a good example of shape. This is silhouetted against a really fun background, but the shape of the gondola that tells the story, we don't need the whole boat, and it's a strong shape. Everything is a shape in your picture, okay? So even the background area is a shape in addition to the shape of the gondola. Here we've got two opposing shapes, the rounded rectangular, somewhat rectangular shape of the car in the way it fills one corner juxtaposed with the window. And then this one, which is all about shapes. You've got circular shapes, rectangular shapes. You've got triangles in here. You've got probably squares. I haven't even looked. And, and this is a picture that brings you to your knees when you turn a corner and you see it. You know you've got photos in there. You could spend a half a day probably working this scene. And we were very lucky that it had rained the night before. So this floor level, this, uh, you know, the, the uh, where the bikes, the whatever you, the surface, that's the word I'm looking for, the surface that they're sitting on, okay, is actually this high. It was like a stage or something where they would do little performances or put, you know, music speakers up on. And so it was perfect because I'm, I'm really already low. I didn't have to get dirty and get down on the ground. I just shot right from here. But it gives you the feeling like I'm lying down on the ground. And it was just an added reflection, added such interest to it. This is also about shapes. Now, there's texture in here, too. But you see there's three basic triangles. Now, the triangles are not finishing in the frame. But here's a triangle here that if you followed this out, you know, would come to a point visually, more or less, without that frame in the way. You've got one here that is clearly more triangular. And then you've got this one here, not quite triangles, but 
you got the idea. All three of those pieces are shapes within the frame. And you just have to decide which one gets more attention than the other. So for me, it was the texture of the olive grove that I liked the most, juxtaposed with the textures of in the lines of the vines. But I gave the, the olive grove the more emphasis. And it was the foreground, so to speak. So in that case, that helped the picture too. Shapes and shadows. Okay, Shadows are shapes. But now I've got the shape of the car, plus I have the shape of the shadow in there. <clears throat> here too, back in Morocco, the Marjorelle Gardens is incredible. The blue that they painted this house is over the top. You can't buy that blue in the States. And I know people that actually bought blue paint powder over there to bring home because they wanted to paint all their pots on their back patio this Moroccan blue. It was pretty funny. So it's the shape of the cactus, the shape of the window, and it's one of those sort of mix song approaches. You know, you're walking in and you see it and you react. And I like how the one cactus arm broke the line of the window and sort of connect the two together a little bit more. In Assisi, in Umbria, we were photographing the monks that were walking all around and the nuns and just different things. And I saw this walkway that goes uphill and I saw the shadow and it was all in color, but the stone was pretty beige, gray color. So not really a lot of color. And the guys were wearing brown robes pretty uh, often. So I waited for one to make the bend and start walking up. And I knew that I would have a great shadow for him because I had seen Taurus walking by. And so I'm just playing with all the shapes here, even down to the shape of the lamp that is in sunlight against the shaded wall. So you've got a triangle here. You've got rectangles. You've got this interesting shape here his shape and the shadow of him, all of that, just playing off of this. And how you arrange that is really up to you and what the elements, I mean, they kind of dictate how you're going to arrange it because you're, you're looking through the frame and you say, well, this is too much, not enough. I got to leave room here so that the point doesn't run into the edge of the frame, you know, and where do I want to, where do I want to release the shutter? Where do I want him to be in the frame, just in or further up, you know? So you kind of get a chance to practice. And again, it's that situation where you found something good, you set it up, you get your composition right, you pre-visualize the moment, and now you just hope that you're going to have somebody that's right walking into your scene. This was all about circular shapes for me in these vendors. Again, that upper viewpoint looking down, even the previous shot, gave me a simple composition. And this just showed all of the different things in their round baskets. And it was a nice image, just as it was a moment she was talking to someone who was up on the dock. But then, excuse me, she put her head back down. And now it's an anonymous picture, but now her hat completes the shapes. All that repetition, and I was like, oh, that's it. Here I was thinking the first shot was it, but I didn't leave. I just kept waiting, and I just kept watching. And when she dipped her head back down, I said, ah, another circle. Isn't that fun? So you just work with what you've got, you know? And then they sell the fish, they tuck them into these round baskets, and I just thought the pattern of all of that was great. Repeating shapes develops a pattern. Repeating shapes, I think by Webster's Dictionary, if you have three or more, it's a pattern. But three or more doesn't really make a very strong pattern, right? You need to have the impact of pattern. You need it to spill out the edges of your frame. You need to have more than two or three things repeating. So I've got quite a bit. And I've got pieces of it, enough that your brain says, oh, I get this. This is a whole pile of them. She's just taken a piece of the pattern. Same thing here. There's more to the railing on either side, but it was just the angles, the shapes that it created. Again, the triangles, this triangle here, this triangle down on the lower left, and then all those wonderful <coughs> scroll works repeating on an angle just made this graphically simple and one of those street scenes that I just like to capture when I'm walking around town. This uh, Queen, Ag Queen Victoria agave in Arizona is an incredible plant. It carries its own pattern with it. So you know, if you can grow one in your garden, you've got lots of photo opportunities to capture pattern. And then the little bug came out, I guess, to see what was going on. And it just broke up the pattern a little bit, which was really neat. But it was just that repetition of shapes. And the leaves were so unique 
that I had a lot of fun photographing that. So again, these pictures get you thinking all over the place because you're all coming from a different interest and walk of life. And so, you know, it may be that nature gets you excited. It may be that the man-made gets you excited. So here it's just dogwoods blooming against the sky. They're backlit. And I love that delicate pattern against that rich blue of the sky. And it's not the staccato pattern of a structured pattern like the fish in the circle bas circular baskets was, but it's still pattern. It's using whatever I can to make the picture more interesting. Yes, you could single out just one or three blossoms and make a beautiful picture of that too against the sky. But for me, it was just this, oh, a great feeling of being under the tree and looking up and seeing all that wonderful spring bloom. Big fields in Tuscany where you've got a pattern that's you know, really random in this case, but you've got the poppies and the white little flowers and the green creating this pattern that runs through the whole field. Here you have to give, it's like music. And in my first book, I talk about that where, you know, if I just snap my fingers twice, you don't have any rhythm from that. But if I stand here and I keep snapping, before you know it, after eight or ten snaps, you're like, okay, I got it. I got her rhythm. And I could actually tap my toe to it, okay? So in music, you need to give it enough time to establish the rhythm in a, in a measure, if you will. Visually, you need to give repetition enough space in a photograph to establish itself. <laughs> So that's the key thing with pattern and rhythm being part of pattern, is that you want enough space for the pattern to repeat so you feel a sense of movement, to feel a sense of rhythm to it. And not every pattern picture will have rhythm, and that's OK. And this isn't really pattern per se, not in the truest definition of the word, although if I did just the shelves with the bottles, that would be a pattern shot. But if I just want to capture the whole shop, it's still got a lot of little mini patterns, if you will, in it. So it makes it very visually interesting because there's a lot of repetition here. There's repetition here with all of the cone-shaped spices. Then there's all the repetition on the back shelving of both shapes and the squared out shelves, the compartments. So there's pattern within pattern happening here. So just even as a snapshot, if you will, it makes for a better picture because of all that pattern. Sometimes you get layers of things going on where I've got a strong pattern from the latticework shadow that's spilling down onto the wall, and then I've got this very strong shape of the window, and then I've got the pattern of the scroll work wire part of the window, and there's just a lot happening in here. But I love the energy of it, and I tried to compose it so that, yes, you had the lines, but rather than the lines taking you out of the frame, you would not go out of the frame because of that white framed window and all of what was happening in there. So it's a little bit of a visual tension because there's a lot of lines that want to take you every which way, but the, the strength of that window anchors you and hopefully holds you within the frame. There's texture to think about in terms of visual design, okay? And frosty leaves or crunchy ice and crunchy snow all has the ability to express texture. A, a, a wool sweater with all of its hair on it can express texture. But it requires a certain type of light for some things to be, to be the best in terms of expressing texture. This was soft light. The frost, because it's crunchy in its own way, is what defines the texture in this picture. But that diffused, quiet, soft light made this picture possible. Now, when the sun came up, it melted the frost. So it's kind of hard to get this picture unless it's really cold in the sunlight. And I was trying. But California barely gets frost where I was. So I was lucky to have that. This is tree trunks in Cuba. And I don't know what the tree is, but when I looked at it, I love the colors of all the different lichens and the patchwork on it. But what I really saw was like folds of fabric when I looked at it. And so I tried to frame it in such a way that it felt sort of like just that, just folds of fabric. Fishing nets in Italy, in Cinque Terre, and the texture of all the nets, the texture of the floats, they've all eventually get eaten away by the salt. The styrofoam takes chunks out of them, and they just paint them over, but they've got texture. So it's thinking, you know, 
all the different ways that you can see texture. You can't touch this texture, but we still have a feeling of texture when we look at this scene because of the light and dark and the, the contrast of that and the fact that there is a pattern and pattern often will start to express texture as well depending on what the subject matter is. But it's really the side light here that is bringing out, it's skimming the surface of this hillside and it's bringing out that contrast that gives us the textural effect. And here, sunlight might have added to this, but it was never going to be because it faced north. And it had enough texture from all the peeling cement and stucco and the brick and the paint. And it looks like clouds and things on this wall. And I just loved it for its simple textural effect. <clears throat> Creating visual depth. We are taking, when we photograph, we are taking a three-dimensional world and we're distilling it into two dimensions. And that's really important to think about because it's our job as photographers to bring back some of the depth that we may have seen to create an illusion of depth. Now, our resulting picture is still two-dimensional and when we make a print, okay, but you can create that depth. And the depth is created with perspective and depth of field also, okay? Now perspective changes as you move the cameras, the, uh, let me rephrase this, as you move your subject in relationship to the background will move. Everything's shifting. And you should practice that this afternoon, okay? If you see something, you say, well, I wish that tree wasn't behind their head. If you move, the tree and the person that you're photographing will separate. The background will move less than the, the foreground, okay? There's a lot of things happening, and that's all perspective in terms of how things are relating to each other and to the camera. So you want to zoom with your feet, you want to lean, you want to get low, get high, do whatever you can, and watch how things move in your scene as you're doing it, looking through the camera, because it's really an important thing to try and get that depth and get the arrangement to work right in your frame. Near-far relationship is all about perspective. It's about the things close to the camera and the things further away. And it's a classic landscape technique done many, many years ago by a lot of 8x10 and 4x5 <laughs> photographers, okay? They always brought something into the foreground so you can reach out and feel like you could touch this. You could leave a handprint on the sand because you're so close. And, you, and I was close, I'm 17 millimeters on my lens, and this is a full frame camera, so it was 17. And I'm in as close as I can be to that to try and really exaggerate my foreground, but not without paying attention to the middle ground and then the background. And so I've got, like a good book, I've got a good story going on here, the beginning, the middle, and the end in this picture. And there's a great suggestion of depth to this image because of that <coughs> near-far relationship. Okay, let's try that again. There we go. All right, same thing here. I'm literally, I have one leg, I'm sitting, and I have one leg over the edge of the rock, dangling down into the water. And it was pretty cold water, but this is on uh, Madeline Island also. It's a beautiful area for workshops. And in the fall, everything's beautiful color. So I wanted the sweep of this rock, and I wanted to show the cut and how sheer it was and the way it's been eroded away by all the storm waves on the lake over time. So the light has just come up. The sunrise has just struck the land. You can see that it's creating wonderful texture here because it's skimming the surface, and the surface is highs and lows. It's like mud ripples, you know, but, but solidified. So that gives some texture to that surface. And you've got this line that draws you back to the vanishing point, if you will. It's not the classic vanishing point where it's even on both sides, but it's still that vanishing point perspective where you're brought back and things get smaller as they get further away. Emphasizing your foreground will suggest that depth in the picture. 
Doesn't have to be as aggressive as those two. It could be a standard lens, a 50 millimeter, or maybe this was an 85. I mean, I don't even remember. And it's still about the near far. It's about that one tree that's out in front. Then there's some trees behind it. And there's layers in this picture as you go back and up to the clouds at the top of the mountain. So there's a suggestion of depth in this. Now it's all sharp, OK? But it's the placement and the arrangement, the physical relationship of things in the frame that suggests the depth, even if it's all sharp. Same thing here. Again, this is a little bit more ag aggressive of a near far because I'm using a wide angle. I was around 20 millimeters for this. And this is, and whenever it comes up, it's a really funny thing. This is above this. But to my eye, this looks like it's sunk in and this is on top. It's the reverse. Some of you may have seen that right away. For some reason, my brain takes a while and then all of a sudden it flips and I see it the way I shot it, the way it physically is. This is glacial polish. It is a piece, a puzzle shaped piece of the surface that the glacier polished and smoothed out and then, and it's hard and it hasn't eroded away yet. Whereas all of this rough stuff is all eroded away and getting all real rough, okay? Really textured. So it's, it may not, is anybody seeing it with that surface on top? No. Not yet? No. God, it came up on my screen last week and, and I saw it this way and all of a sudden, just, just like that, I saw it the other way. And I'm not seeing it the other way now, but I'm also not straight onto it and that may play into it here. So anyway, it is a difference in surfaces. Whether it's in or out doesn't really matter, but it's that near far. I wanted to talk about the glacial polish and the fact that this piece, these are remnants of it on Olmstead Point and have you be led back to the trees and the sky and so forth to give some depth to the picture, but still have the foreground be the emphasis. Okay, in architecture, inside, in man-made things, you can do the same thing, all right? I worked to get this all straight, you know, and, and just get it all structurally right because I loved the, the, the design of the building. And when I did it without the fountain, it was just kind of there, you know, it was really two-dimensional. By backing up and including the fountain, even though it's not running, now I've got a foreground element and it's a visual stepping stone and it just adds interest to the front and the back. So now you've got depth added to the picture. This is more classic vanishing point, okay? where you just really go down that hallway and all lines lead to the end. And that's pretty typical. And, and you can get that with roads and telephone piles, rows of trees. You get a lot of vanishing point perspective. But again, it's the depth. Okay, there's not anything real strong in the foreground. Maybe if there had been another potted plant, I might have included that. But I decided that it would be just the tile work and just the vanishing point that would bring you all the way down. Leading lines are another way to suggest depth, right? So again, it's the near-far relationship still. You've got, I'm in real close to those tobacco leaves in the foreground, but I've got enough of the rows and the suggestion of the lines bringing you back to the little farmhouse. And then, of course, there's scale going on because you have these big Magothe formations in the background, and all of that adds to the story. But it's that low perspective. Now, if you just stood there and shot straight out, yes, you'd still see some of the rows, Okay, but it was pretty thick, the growth at that point. But, but it's not as dynamic. By getting closer and a little bit angled, you're emphasizing that foreground. So again, remember to do that with even a normal lens. It doesn't have to be wide angle, although you'll get more exaggeration with a wide angle lens. Think about near and far, but selective focus. Now I don't care about everything being sharp. I want this one cheerful sunflower to stand out by itself and say, hi, look at me. And, and it's kind of that outstanding in the field stock photography concept, you know, that maybe it would get used for that if you have just one thing sharp. This flower is outstanding in its field. Everything else tells you the story about the field, but it doesn't compete with the subject because it's out of focus. I take that same technique 
into a monastery and they're all lined up and they're coming down the hallway from back to front and they get here and they make a right hand turn and they cross right in front of me. And I suddenly see the possibility that if I can time it right where they make the turn and, there's, and the monk in front of them hasn't stopped so there's space, then I'll be able to get a view to the background and out of focus but still have that foreground be the story with their rice bowl so you know what's going on and you get the sense that there's a lineup, you know. And that's all it took to do that. Here in the Changing of the Guard in London, there's a lot going on when that's happening and I thought, I just love the, the whole regalness of their uniforms and their hats and everything about it, the pomp and circumstance. And so I didn't want him to blend in with his regiment. So he's deliberately thrown out of focus with a wide aperture so that I can really keep you focused on him, but still have the story of where he is and what's going on behind him. Okay, so selective focus will create that depth. And then something that I learned again from Sam Abel was layering and having depth by many layers using windows and mirrors and different things, you can generate a lot of depth and story. So my first reaction was, oh look, a little boy's gonna get his hair cut. That was the first thing that made me stop to say, I think I wanna photograph this. It wasn't until I picked up my camera and I looked at everything, I realized that I had the boy's face in the mirror, and then I had the guy behind, and then I have, because of other mirrors, I have more people that you don't even see in the real frame because they're reflected in the mirror. So all of that just gave some depth and dimension to this picture and made it much more interesting than if it was just solid walls with one mirror. So that's what made that fun. And this last bit is gesture. How am I doing? It's okay, we're good. All right, and so Henry Cartier-Bresson said it, and photography is like that, it's yes, 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 and there's no maybe, it's a presence, it's a moment, it's there. And you can apply that to a lot of different things in photography, but especially gesture, whether it's man gesturing, <coughs> or animals gesturing, or just other ways that gesture happens, and we're gonna look at that. It's there, and it's exciting. So I'm photographing a rookery that literally exists in downtown Santa Rosa on 9th and Dutton. And there's five trees and every year we get egrets, black crowned night herons, and a few others in there. And it's just the cacophony of noise and the neighbors don't like it because their cars get trashed every spring. But it's a great place to photograph and they're so close. So I go and I'm photographing them flying and building their nest, bringing snakes back and lizards for the babies and all of this. And when they come in, because I'm paying attention to behavior now, I realize that they're putting on the brakes. They're like, whoa, I'm coming in too fast, you know? And so the wings are out, the feet are out, and they're squawking, honey, I'm home, you know? At the same time, they would always make this little squawking noise, like here I come. And so I thought, if I can do this, if I just keep working it, I'm gonna get it. And I have a lot of misses. But you get one, or th I get greedy, I want five that are really good, you know, so I keep working it, even though I think I've got it, I still keep working it until the light's gone, and it's, I have to go back to work or something. So gesture, it's about that moment where there's an expression in the body language of the subject, okay? And that's what really captures you. It's the gesture of this, these two cubs playing, and, and they played us, too. I'm, I'm convinced they, they, they would sit with their backs to us and then they would turn and look and fall over. <laughs> now, why were they looking at us before they fell over in the grass with their feet up? Maybe to make sure that they were safe, that we weren't too close, I don't know. There's gotta be some reason, but they were just hams. And so that gesture when they were playing, I've got them play biting, you know, their mouths are open, numerous gestures, but I love this one. It was that little paw, which is quite dangerous, but that little paw, and there was just something soft about, oh, my sibling, my buddy, you know? And the color difference between the bears made that also really nice. So you get lucky. The more you do it, the luckier you get. So I thought this was just a cute moment where she's going for a taxi. I love how she's got her hand up and her finger out delicately and her butt says, miss, you know? <laughs> 
so you know everything and it was just the classic old cars as opposed to the modern cars was a fun gesture now this is one of these situations where it was a rent a monk you know the, the <laughs> monastery is near is right across the street and so our guy just called up and said I'm coming with a photography group <laughs> and if you if there if you're not in class and there's a few monks that are willing to be in photographs we'd like to have you come over and and often what people will do is they'll work portraits or they had their rice bowls and they would lean in against the pillars and some people did different things and so one man wanted a jumping monk I don't like what a jumping monk he had seen a picture where this young boy ran down the hall and leapt into the air and he wanted that shot now it had already been done it was a girl in his camera club she had won a prize with it he wanted that shot he's pretty competitive so I said I, I'm sorry but that's I think that's inappropriate and I I don't want to set that up but you can talk to the guide if he says it's okay for the boys to be doing that then that's your call. So Gene went over and he had a chat with him and the guide said, yeah, it'll be okay, it's fine, right? Well, the first guy hardly could get off the ground. He just didn't have the jump concept <laughs> in him, you know? And so we had, to, we had to retire him. And so then this other boy was really sweet and he would run down and he would leap. Well, unfortunately, when he leapt, his robe and everything went flying up and he was naked. <laughs> so those pictures don't go in the show. <laughs> and, and that was that. So, you know, it was taken a couple of tries where the group wasn't getting what they wanted. And, and so finally, uh, we were all done. Everybody was happy with whatever they were getting from it. And he was finished and he was going to walk back into the monastery or into the temple area. And he was readjusting his robe. And that's when I got this <laughs> shot. And this was, to me, much more exciting than a jumping monk, you know? It's, it was just that candid, honest moment that I got and the gesture of him readjusting and the light coming through it. <gasps> and when people saw this, they said, when did you see that? I was like, after the jumping monk. You just weren't, you thought you were done, you know? And you walked away and you didn't pay attention to him leaving. So, so there are setups that we will do because when they do come and they pray in, in these locations, you can sometimes get a very natural shot, but sometimes it's difficult. There may not be a, a monk around or a person around. It's a very tight space for this reclining Buddha that we photograph at. So we just asked the monk to, if he would, you know, move himself in there and he picked up the candle himself and held it but it's that gesture that makes this picture so nice you know because it's part of that devotion in the prayers body language really plays an important part this is a very simple composition but this guy is walking like he's got a pack full of rocks you know and in the only way he can keep from falling over this way is to really put a lean on it as he goes this way and and he's got a referee shirt on which you know wasn't but it, it was in Guatemala and it was one of the traditional clothes style but it looks like a referee shirt for me and anyway his gesture was really great and that's all that was okay here behind the scenes in Bhutan when they're getting ready to do the religious dances and all at a festival um, you can get great pictures while they're dressing and so his wife was helping him get his mask on and the lay monks you know are the ones that perform in a lot of it not just the ones that live in the monastery so that gesture and the angle again now you've got this sort of opposing angles on their faces but her hand ties the two together and creates the gesture and that moment and gesture and moment are so tied together okay I asked this woman obviously I'm standing there with camera on me and I asked her if I could photograph her and she said yes and she just sort of shyly she said yes and she went like that and that was the only moment I got and then she took her hands down and her expression changed it wasn't you know negative but it just wasn't the same so you have to be ready for things like this because if you're going okay now just wait a minute here let's see do I want f8 no I oh I gotta frame it so I don't get that in the background okay you've lost them and if you are going to take a few moments seconds or minutes to photograph people talk to them 
Doesn't matter whether they can understand you or not. You could be talking about your cat and how it ran down the stairs with the catnip in its mouth and da 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 da. They, you know, they're not understanding you, but if you talk, you keep the person engaged. If you don't talk and you're behind your camera and you're just this quiet thing and you're like, they start to feel uncomfortable and things freeze up and you don't get that relaxation. So you want to keep your subject engaged, even though we're not talking about portrait photography here. It is a, an important part when you're doing street photography. This gesture told the story that he's learning his letters and learning to say words and so forth. Not that we can understand what those are, but the story is there. It's definitely a classroom. And I just loved his eyes and how he was pointing at it. They had to go up and they had to tap each word and say it. And that was repetitive. So I got ready for my turn and I knew what I wanted when they got up there. I knew what to expect. In Chichi Castananga, I watched that the church is for you know the Catholic religion, but there's a lot of Indian religions that go on as well. And so this was part of it. All over the steps, they just they crack eggs, they put candles, they melt the wax and stick the candles up. And then she had a coffee can and she was burning incense and saying all these prayers. And it was just watching the swing of it and trying to get the gesture and that moment frozen where it told a story of swinging this incense can so you could see what it was, you know, and, and just have that all come together. So you just practice. And, you, and I got a lot of misses where it was too much smoke all of a sudden and, you, and it, it just obscured her. So I had to keep working it until I got something that I liked. I thought this was fun because this is also gesture. And those of you that may have studied or heard Jay Mizell speak know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, there is a video, um, an interview with him that's on YouTube. You should look it up because he talks about gesture that has nothing to do with animals or humans reaching out or smiling or doing anything. But it's the gesture in a photograph. And this felt like hands parting two curtains to look out, even though it's fishing net that they hang up for privacy but still allow airflow in Italy. What's the gesture in this one? The curtain, right. Now without the curtain, there's a gesture of her just as she's going in her door, but it's not as exciting. It was the fact that the wind took the curtain and flipped it up and said, Look, I see you, I know that you're going in your door, you know, and it was just that moment that made that picture more interesting. It could be the gesture of an umbrella that somebody came out the little balcony door, put their umbrella out there to dry, and then went back in. And it was just that little element against the wall told a story and the color contrast was fun, okay? So gesture in a broader sense. I watched as they circumambulated the temples in Bhutan and they would not spin every wheel necessarily. Some of them would skip wheels here and there. But I watched and as they went by, I would make pictures of them spinning the wheels. But then I thought, you know, I would like a picture of just the wheels, but a static shot of the wheels would be where nothing's spinning. So what if you could capture it after the wheel was spun and somebody moved on? Well, I tried that after numerous attempts and it just, it, it wasn't the right wheel, they, you know, compositionally, and I finally, I'm on my tripod and I finally said, I can spin a wheel. <laughs> so I went up, I, put the, I, I walked up, and I knew which one I wanted to spin, and I spun it, and I went back, and I waited for it to get to a speed to where I felt like you could see that the letters were on it, and it was mimicking the other parts, and that was the time that I made the shot. So I confess, I made it happen, but it was a real shot that I just wasn't getting in the moment, you know, because they didn't know what I was what one I wanted spun. So this is another gesture, an exploding wave on the Malacan in Cuba. And it happened to be in storm light with that spotlight effect of the sun breaking through the storm clouds. And so it's dramatic for that as well, but it's the gesture of nature that you're seeing here. And again, as I said, gesture and moment go together hand in hand. So the gesture is in the sea star in this wonderful position of its arms, like it's dancing to get away, okay? And trying to maybe hurry because that incoming wave is gonna take it and sweep it away to other parts. And that is the moment, the, the wave 
rushing in and the fact that I blurred the shutter on it so that it would blur enough suggests the moment is about to, you know, that the sea star is about to be overtaken. And so it's a combination of those two things that I saw in this. This is also moment. It's that peak moment when the, the uh, porpoise or the um, Pacific dolphin, the, I, I know, the Pacific uh, white-sided dolphin is leaping out of the water. And you never know when they're going to happen. It's so fast. And so it's like, whoop, we're out. And that's it. And so thousands of pictures later, you get five or six that you're really thrilled with. And this was one. Because the surface of the water was smooth, that particular moment when we had them bow riding the boat. And, and it just leapt out. And the shutter speed was right. And I have this moment. And I've got gesture all wrapped up into that shot. and. I also left space. This is uncropped, and I managed to actually have enough space in the direction that it was leaping, which was amazing because it happened so fast. So body language and, and that, that peak of some action will define the moment and the gesture. And I like that you've got a black and white and color image here, that the guy in the orange and yellow swim trunks and his body language is, you know, he's like running to get away from the wave, when actually what he was doing was running to body surf, standing up or throwing themselves down, body surfing on the wave when it would come over the wall and it would fill this whole area. It was like body surfing right on the beach. And they would throw themselves down on this pavement and, and hydroplane. And they loved it repeatedly. But I love the girl in the back kind of like, ah! But they get soaking wet and then they don't care because it's hot and it cools them off. So we were photographing a situation on Inle Lake in Myanmar where the, the traditional fishing doesn't happen much anymore. There are still some families that do it, but it's really a dying art, a dying trade. And so now they've discovered that they can make money by posing as traditional fishermen <laughs> <laughs> for all of us who want those pictures. We're all, we all want to hold time, right? We don't want these traditional, wonderful things to fade away. And so how can you not want to make these pictures when you go there, even though it becomes cliche when everybody that's been to Myanmar goes to Inle Lake and gets the fishermen, and they put their foot up with the basket, and they do all these poses. And so I shot probably 2,000 pictures in two and a half days of fishermen doing different things. And I had to whittle that down to just a few good ones. And one of the ones that I ended up really liking was not when they were posing with their feet out and pretending to you know, fish and whatnot, but when they were having a smoke break. And they were just sitting like they would if they were out on the lake taking a break from fishing. And they would just sit and have a smoke and have a chat. And I loved that moment. You know, so I waited for the gesture where he had, he took the, the cigar out of his mouth and he had it in his hand and his mouth, they were talking. And I just liked the guy on the, the right with his hands on his paddle, all of it worked. And it was really nice that we had water that reflected well for that situation. And so, yes, I have other good pictures of the traditional poses and other things, but I work the fringes. I'm always looking at what's happening outside of or behind me when everything seems to be in front. I always remember to turn around. And that's a sign of also being open and being more creative is that you'll be remembering to look around you at the peripheral, the effect the sun is having on the land, not just the sunset. Okay, and so on a rainy day, here was just this moment where I had I could see other people walking. I could see the reflection on the wooden bridge. And when these three monks went walking, I thought, well, let's just see what happens. And fortunately, their umbrellas were all in a neat position that they basically separated nicely. And I waited for just tried to time it for feet to be up, some sort of gesture that made it look like they really were walking, not that I said, OK, hold that, you know, for a pose. Because I want my images to be natural. And I try not to set them up. So this is a moment that's a little bit more subtle. but. 
if you're really, really working your seeing, you're going to spot stuff like this, where here's this dog, and he's guarding his space, and there's a dog on the TV show. You know? And it's a husky, which is kind of funny for Cuba, but it was some program that somebody inside was watching, and, and it would have been great if the dog had been sitting outside and also watching, but he didn't. But I just thought that he was at least, they were both looking the same direction. It was all really fun. And I was inside an, uh, an herborist uh, in uh, Marrakesh where you can, the Berber pharmacies, you get all these wonderful herbs and salves and creams and argon oil and you name it. And I happened to like the view out the door and I saw people walking by with various things on their heads and under their arms. And I thought, well, I'm just gonna kind of wait it out and see. And since it happened so quickly in that narrow window or doorway, you don't really know. So everybody that walked in, I shot even though they ended up not being the right person. It was just a reflexive action because if they were right, I had to get it. And I think the third try, I got this guy who couldn't have had better colors on for his surroundings, and he's carrying a tagine under his arm, and I was lucky enough to get it to where I also had his reflection in the door glass just a little bit. So it's, it's not like a great shot, but it's just illustrated, and it's here to talk about this idea of really, really looking and seeing what the potential is. And the more you do that, the more lucky things happen to you, the better it gets. And these last few are gesture also, but done using motion, thinking about panning with a, a moving subject, or, or maybe just having the subject move through a still scene. There's a lot of different ways you can do this. But panning, I'm about a 15th of a second, really colorful wall. And I just thought there's got to be something we can do with this graffiti wall. And so I tried just a sharp shot of the wall with cyclists going through. And that worked OK. But I finally decided that the wall was so graphic and so strong that it too needed to be blended by panning. So that's how I did this shot. And you know, you can decide how sharp things need to be. It takes, if you're used to having stuff sharp, it's really hard to go this direction because you throw out more than you keep because you say, oh no, it's not sharp enough. But then again, that's the whole idea is that it's sort of this life in motion thing, you know. So you just have to experiment with that idea and play with it. Now, in this one, I knew that I wanted the rail crossing sign sharp. So that was fine. And I just wanted to wait for the train to move by. And I didn't really know what shutter speed I was going to need. So fortunately, there were enough cars on this old steam locomotive that when the train, the engine went by, okay, which I didn't want because I wanted something more colorful, I could at least get a shot, look at it quickly, and say, oh, I need to go slower. Okay. So by the time I had the yellow cars going by, and there were three or four of those, I was able to get the shutter speed right. So you knew it was a train car, and it has great color against the blue sky, and I'm low and I'm looking up so that I can put the rail crossing sign against the sky. This is where perspective and that point of view came into play. When I was standing, the railroad crossing sign was right against the train car and that wasn't going to work. So by just getting part way down, not all the way down, but part way down, I push that sign up into the sky space and make the picture work. You can think about slow shutter speeds in a situation where you might not otherwise use it. But there's a frenzy in this market inside. This is also Chichi Castananga, but inside the building. And it's heavy produce sales going on. And, and I did straight shots of it. And then I thought, OK, well, that's fine. But what if, again, asking myself, what if? What if I slowed the shutter down? Can I get a shot where there will be people still that are staying, they're taking a long time to choose their bananas, so they'll be registered fairly sharply, but other people will be moving, and I'll get that sort of frenzy, that feeling of the energy of a market. So still working on that. I try it all the time, because you never know when you're going to get one that really works. But it's, it's using that motion to express gesture, and also, in a sense, abstract the moment a little bit by blurring it, because life is a blur anyway, right? <laughs> so that's my last image, but I want to leave you with this quote, OK? And this came from a yogi tea bag. 
So drink tea, and you get wonderful quotes on your little tea bag thing that you, you use to pull the bag out. But I love this, and I used it on my website homepage for a while, and I've changed it out with some other quotes. But it really is photography guided by your heart opening up to seeing without question and acknowledging and looking at the wonderful, beautiful things that are around us and just responding from the heart. Taking that emotional response and adding to it the mastery of your craft so that you've got the right shutter speeds, the right f-stops, you've got the framing and all of that working for you too. Because there's nothing worse than having this gorgeous scene fall apart because you didn't get your craft right and you miss the shot. And we've all been there and it hurts. It hurts a lot. So the more you practice your craft, and I was talking to uh, one of the sales guys, Steve, um, looking at a flash for my new camera system. And we were talking about how no photographers read the manuals, right? We don't read our manuals. Come on, we can figure this out. And well, we have to these days, you know. But, but the idea that we were, oh, it just went right out of my head. I hate that when that happens. Mm. Um, we'll just leave it at that because I can't recall <laughs> what it was. I've got too much in my brain right now too. So, but it's, it's just really about responding and about, oh, I, it came back to me, good. It was about how many of you know which way your lens focuses closer versus farther away? How many of you know which way you want to zoom to go bigger or smaller? Okay, how many of you in a dark room or with your eyes closed can find all the buttons that you need on your camera and know which way to turn them to get the shutter speed faster or slower, all right? The more you can do that with your eyes closed in the dark and practice it, then the quicker you can respond to any moment that's out there and you're not going, whoops, went the wrong way. Oh darn, missed that moment, you know? So it's beyond just the f-stops. It's also about being one with your camera. So I hope that you've enjoyed this and you got a lot from it. I know your heads are stuffed. Take a break. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.